In a tower on a western shore A woman cries in pain Outside a storm Is born again. The wisdom of all of the world shines like the sun from his eyes. His father, a god of the earth, holds his mother in his arms as she dies. Thank you. 
are stirring the cauldron. Now, here's your host, Marla Brooks. Hey, Merry Meet, everybody, and welcome to Stirring the Cauldron here on the Parrot X Radio Network, and happy St. Patty's Day to you all. Now, tonight's opening song, again, could not be more fitting. Uh, it was Merlin I Am I by Dave the Bard, and Merlin is the topic for tonight. My guest is author Graham Phillips, and Graham is one of Britain's best-selling nonfiction authors for over 20 years. In the 1980s, after working as a radio journalist and broadcaster for the BBC and editing a popular monthly magazine, Graham turned his talents to investigating unsolved historical mysteries. He's since written 12 books, which are in print around the world. Um, among his latest are Alexander the Great, Murder in Babylon, which examines the mysterious death of history's most renowned soldier, The Templars of the Ark of the Covenant, in which Graham goes in search of the lost Ark, and Merlin, The Discovery of Avalon in the New World, a personal quest to discover the truth behind the Merlin legend. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. And Graham, welcome. Nice to have you with us tonight. Uh, My pleasure. You know, I have to start out by saying that even before I actually got to begin reading the book, just the back cover and the snippets on the website that you have were amazingly captivating. So uh, if it seems like I'm going to be hopping around like a March hare from topic to topic, it's because certain things jumped out at me and I really want to cover as much ground as possible in a short hour. That's so, fine. <laughs> so we're going to be, you know, all over the place here. But, but basically, you know, the first thing that came to mind was where does one even begin a search of this nature? Because if I'm not mistaken, the stories of the legendary Merlin were um, from Arthurian romances, and they were written many hundreds of years after Merlin was supposed to have lived. And those writings may not necessarily be easy to get a hold of on their own, but then writings and research that goes back those few hundred years before that must be nearly impossible. Wouldn't it? Yes, the it's very difficult. But luckily, there are very few writings that actually survive from what we call the Dark Ages, which was the period after when the Romans left Britain in 410 AD up until about a thousand years ago, a period of five, six hundred years where civilization in Britain virtually collapsed. And that a period known as the Dark Ages. Some people are familiar with the Vikings. That was the period when the Vikings were trying to invade Britain. It's the period when the Anglo-Saxons invaded and um, were fighting with the native Britons, also known as the Celts. And because of these turbulent times, um, very few writings were actually preserved. And so there's only a few relating to the period in which Merlin is said to have existed, which was around 500 AD, 1500 years ago. Um, And so you've only got two or three surviving manuscripts to look through. So, yes, on the one hand, it's it's problematic because there's very few writings survive. On the other hand, you don't have all that much to sift through. (laughs) That makes sense. I didn't think about that. But, yeah, (laughs) that makes very good sense. And, you know, this is a real, truly um, life detective story, you know, historical detective story. And it took you nearly 20 years to research and investigate. And during that time, from what I read, you uncovered evidence that Merlin is more than just a myth and that his story is based on the real, the life of a real life historical figure, Ambrosius Aurelius, who, it's said in British poetry, that... um, he was a bard driven mad after witnessing the horrors of war. See, I did a little research and it could be wrong. Um, but he fled civilization to become a wild man of the woods in the 6th century, which is, in a way, fits the mythical Merlin profile. Um, so who exactly was Ambrosius? Well, the earliest stories concerning Merlin to still survive all refer to him under the name of Ambrosius. The name Merlin was only a name he took once he had um, become this accomplished wizard or magician. And um, there was an historical figure called Ambrosius 
who's recorded in these few historical manuscripts that survive, um, who lived around 500 AD. And he was, in fact, he started off as a warrior leading the Britons against, in their fight against the invading Anglo-Saxons from Germany. Um, he led them just before the period that Arthur takes over. His full name was Ambrosius Aurelius, and this man then um, disappears from history. We don't actually know what happens to him. And the later writings tell us that after his time, then Arthur ascends to the throne of Britain. So it would seem, and this is a bit of guesswork, that we know this Ambrosius definitely existed and that he was a, a British leader. But it seems that perhaps he retired because he was old or perhaps he was wounded and then became an advisor to his successor, um, the young Arthur. So he definitely existed. You mentioned there the wild man of the forest. Many of the earliest references to Merlin in old British poetry and other tales refer to Merlin after the period that Arthur is Britain's king. Arthur dies. Merlin apparently eventually becomes a recluse, goes mad, and as a very old man, lives out his life in a forest. So you've got like three parts of Merlin's life, according to the earliest writings. The earliest ones tell us he's a, a warrior. He then retires from being a warrior, becomes an advisor to Arthur, and then later on becomes something of a mad recluse or a hermit with prophetic powers living in a forest. So it was like a, he shape shifted actually at, at, from a human, uh, yeah, from a guy to a wizard in a sense. I mean, the story as the story goes, um, because it's was there a link to? Okay, so the you were talking about the link to King Arthur was the link under the name of Ambrosius as the advisor to King Arthur. The link to King Arthur is under both names. His actual name in the earliest references is Merlin Ambrosius. And mm -hmm. I wanted to know why this, why, why was he called Merlin if his name was Ambrosius? It mm -hmm. turns out that Merlin was an old British word for eagle, like the bird. Mm -hmm. Right. And right. it appears that uh, many Celtic f figures, whether they were priests, warriors, um, holy men, etc., were given the the name of an animal in which, in some way, which to um, to represent their prowess. Um, mm -hmm. If it was a warrior, he may be called the lion or something like this. Um, mm -hmm. And it seems that somebody who was considered to be a uh, a great seer or prophet was given the name the eagle, i.e., Merlin. And in fact, there are in, there are around three separate figures throughout the 6th century that have been recorded, each having the name Merlin. And our Merlin Ambrosius is just the first of these. It seems to have been, in other words, an honorary title for mm. the person who was the chief bard in Britain. Now, what a bard was, was somebody in, in the Dark Ages who was primarily a poet. They worked for the king or a chieftain to record their exploits in poetic form or in song or ballads. But it, that was, although that was their chief role, it wasn't all they did. They also were considered to be great metallurgists and were able to advise the king on how to uh, make the best kind of weapons. They were mm -hmm. accredited with prophetic powers and people took their um, advice very seriously when it came to how should we fight this battle, what should we do next, and so forth. So it seems that there was a bard, a chief bard, or holy man, by the name of Ambrosius, who had the title Merlin, who existed exactly the same time as Arthur is said to have lived, around 500 AD. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, I mean, it gets a little complicated because... The Merlin that we've all read about is magical, you know, said to have been born of a mortal woman, sired by an incubus, the non-human from whom he inherited his supernatural powers, supposedly, which probably wasn't the case with Ambrosius, as far as birth parents are concerned anyway. Um, 
so why do you think that legend kind of has brought out the wizard or magician Merlin rather than the human Merlin, the, the mortal, mortal Merlin, if you want to call it that? I think that's because of the power of the Christian church during the Middle Ages. Um, or if you could actually find the various stories of King Arthur and Merlin, sometimes Merlin completely separately to Arthur, mm-hmm. written down from around about 600 AD. And like, if you take one every century, going up until the Middle Ages, which start in about 1000 AD, Mm-hmm. You find that to start off with in these tales, Merlin is very much the magician, if you like, the wizard, the man with prophetic powers. And then gradually, but he also does this advising on military tactics and so forth. Mm-hmm. But So you've got him as a kind of a bit of both. And then the, the longer we go on, the more that the Christian church's influence occurs in Britain, the more the side of him being a wizard or a prophet start to wane and we have more and more of him simply being this advisor to um to king arthur now we do have so by the time the middle ages comes about and people are writing the stories then merlin still does have some of these prophetic powers mm-hmm. um uh, but he's pr- primarily considered to be just a an advisor on military matters You've then somehow got a complete flip in the in, in the thing where it's just the prophetic side of him that's remembered. And it seems mm-hmm. a bit of a backlash in Britain against the, um, the Roman Catholic Church because in 1066, Britain was invaded by the Normans from France and the Anglo-Saxons, who had become very religious and very much part of the Roman Catholic Church, were suppressed by the Normans, who, although Christians tended to have a, a slightly different idea of, uh, of Christianity and didn't suppress the ideas of, um, of, of the ancient pagans. And so consequently, they started saying, fine, if you want to write stories about Merlin being a magician and a wizard, that is fine. And so this backlash meant that all the stories concerning Merlin as being a warrior on being anything other than just this this wizard with miraculous powers goes completely, and that's how it the story survives to this day. Well, it's a much more colorful person that is a wizard or magician. So, um, I mean, just you know the the whole Arthurian stories and how Merlin is transgressed over the ages. It's rather amazing that. Anybody even thinks that there might have been a human person, a mortal person, rather than this larger-than-life figure that we've all grown up with, in a sense. Yes, over the years, um, I think, obviously, if you're going to write a story, the story is going to be more popular if it's got uh, the kind of um, things that are associated with uh, magic and mystery rather than simply boring military tactics. But it, very, it is very interesting. I mean, there, there, even though a lot of this stuff today might sound to scientists to be a bit, uh, or to modern historians to be a bit silly, uh, mm-hmm. a lot of these stories associated with Merlin could really be um, historical fact. For example, we have the situation where Merlin is the person who finds Excalibur for Mm -hmm. Arthur. He gets it from the Lady of the Lake, and then when Arthur is dying, um, Excalibur is thrown back into the lake by one of Arthur's knights, and the arm of the Lady of the Lake grabs the weapon and takes it down into the water. Now, modern historians would say, well, that's just a silly idea. I mean, you know, that just couldn't happen. But we now know from archaeological excavations that... um, the Celtic people of Britain around the time Arthur and Merlin are said to have existed, as part of their funerary practices, would throw the, uh, a, a particular important object that belonged to a high-status individual, such as a king, into a sacred lake or pool as an offering to... Originally, it would have been a water goddess, but as they became semi-Christianized, it became to a female saint. And the idea was they threw these items into this water and they believed that these would 
a grant them passage to the underworld, votive offerings as these are known. And the practice of throwing swords into um, a lake when a king lay dying in a hope of curing him, or if he died in the hope of securing him passage to the underworld, um, are not only attested to by writers of that t- period, but also um, archaeological excavations have found these items in the dried up mud at the bottom of, um, you know, old evaporated lakes. So mm-hmm. it could have been based on such a, you know, such a story as that, that the story of Excalibur came about. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, this just popped into my head and it, it probably means nothing in the whole scheme of things, but it's just an in- interesting coincidence that you spent 20 years investigating the Merlin legend. And Merlin spent 20 years supposedly in the forest learning to become a druid. Um, now, Merlin supposedly learned a lot in those 20 years. Uh, how would you assess the learning curve in your 20 years of researching him? That's, that's an interesting point. Um, well, I started off by thinking he was completely a legend and mm-hmm. just a made-up story. I, mm-hmm. I kind of thought that Arthur was real um, because there was more more written about him and um but Merlin's side, I thought, no, that was one of the more fanciful themes in the Arthurian story. But then I changed from that to thinking, wow, you know, this guy Ambrosius really existed. So the Merlin that did exist was purely and simply um, a warrior who then retired and trained Arthur or advised Arthur. But the magician thing was made up. Then mm-hmm. I moved to realizing that they, this tradition of bards or head druids, if you like, mm-hmm. uh, that existed during the Dark Ages, and the fact that they were there was a number of them by the name of Merlin, which meant the eagle, all fitted into an historical context. Finding out then that Ambrosius is also referred to as Ambrosius the Eagle Merlin, I thought, wow, he was also accredited with having these supernatural powers so that so in other words as the 20 years went by my investigation into into Merlin suggested first he existed then that he was just a warrior then of course that he was a a magician or a wizard as well and so the story kind of blossomed into the to a Merlin that ended up something an historical Merlin that ended up something along along the lines of the story that we know and love Mm mm-hmm I like it. <laughs> um, speaking of druids, I listened to a snippet of an interview that you did a few years back, and you spoke of how druids of old had different abilities than the way we think of magic now. And it was mentioned that they used their minds to accomplish such things as being able to levitate stones. And it's theorized that that's how Stonehenge was created, but... You said in the interview that the druid responsible for Stonehenge could have been Merlin himself. And that was something I had never heard before. Has Merlin ever been linked to Stonehenge before? Yes. The earliest legends associated with Stonehenge say that it was Merlin who built the stone circle. Now, these legends can be dated back to, I think the earliest reference I've found to this is uh, at least 13 hundred years old so you've got very old legends associated with Stonehenge to say that Merlin built it but the interesting thing is that these stories say that Merlin built Stonehenge by levitating the stones with his power and the power of his magic staff that he had Um, and it became known as the giant's dance Um, because I think the early part of the legend stated that these stones were originally giants who had been turned into stone by some predecessor of Merlin. And then Mm -hmm. Merlin decided to have them placed where they now are. But the interesting thing historically is that Stonehenge in southern Britain stands right next to a town called Amesbury. Now, Amesbury, the, the derivation of that name comes from Amesbury and Amesbury, was the old British name for Ambrosius, which is a wow. Romanized Latin name. So it basically means Ambrosius Town. Now, historians today are quite happy to associate that town and its founding with the 
leader of the Britons called Ambrosius. Of course, they wouldn't go so far as to accept that the association with Ambrosius and Merlin is anything more than a, than a legend. But my own research has suggested that these people were one and the same. So the historical Merlin, if you like, did in fact come from or found a town which is only three miles away from Stonehenge. So whether he did levitate stones or whether they were ever really giants is another question. The fact is that Merlin, I believe, really is associated with that area. Mm -hmm. I like to think they're giants, and he gave them a home. Uh, that's fine. <laughs> final, that's fine. <laughs> final you know, resting place. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, that's besides the point. It's just so much more colorful that way. Now, I want to get to kind of the New World aspect. And so if, yeah, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, Merlin was thought to be buried in the chapel of Marlborough College in Wiltshire, and his tomb is also thought to be in Brittany, in France. But in your book, you mentioned a mysterious tomb in New England. Um, is that the one off the coast of Maine here in the States? Yes. Um, the, this was one of the most fascinating aspects of the research. I, I thought it was quite remarkable enough that Merlin, the historical Merlin, tended, uh, turned out to be really associated with magic and mysticism. But this really sort of blew my mind because one of the very earliest stories about Merlin, written in around about 650 AD, now this is thought to have been taken from an earlier story, written closer to the time Merlin actually lived, um, is called The Voyage of Merlin. And it talks about Merlin setting off to sail to Avalon. Now, most of the stories of Avalon, where Arthur is later buried in various t accounts, uh, and where Merlin originally got his sword Excalibur from, that he gave to Arthur, um, Avalon is said to be across the western seas from Britain. Now, most people assume that it's like a couple of miles off the coast. But in this tale, the, the, the voyage of Merlin, Merlin decides to set off in search of Avalon. This is after Arthur's died, and he's been mad in the forest for a while as a hermit, and then he decides he's going to sail off to Avalon. Mm -hmm. So with a group of people who know what Avalon is, he sails across the sea. But rather than it taking a, a few hours and just sail across to an, a, a close island to Britain, this, month, this voyage takes months and months. And it's full of all sorts of strange and weird tales. For example after they've been sailing for so many weeks or days, I can't remember what it is now, about two weeks, they find themselves at an island that they refer to the Isle of Sheep. There is only sheep on the island. No humans live there. It's just full of sheep, which are odd, but you think there must be some significance <laughs> to that tale. They mm -hmm. then sail on, and suddenly they find themselves in a place where there are huge, great floating islands, white floating islands that crash together and they have to steer the boat between these floating islands. Another completely crazy story, it would seem. They sail on and eventually they reach a land of fire where huge fireballs are thrown into the air by unseen giants and these fireballs fall into the water. And then they sail on until eventually they reach the shores of Avalon. Now, everybody just assumes that this is a completely made-up tale, but I suddenly started to think about it, and I thought, hold on, this sounds like an actual voyage. Some of the early Viking voyages from Europe to North America describe, firstly, arriving at an island that they referred to, and these, were, these, these Viking voyages were like 500 years after Merlin's time, mm -hmm. um, they refer to an island called the Isle of Sheep. Now, mm -hmm. a few hundred miles north of Britain, there is an, a, a, a group of islands called the Faroe Islands, which in Norwegian actually are called the Isle of Sheep, because for some reason, the only sheep live on this island. I think it was cut off from mainland Europe just after the Ice Age, and these particular rare breed of sheep survived there, and they're still there to this day. So this wow. island of sheep really did exist. So whoever wrote this story of Merlin's voyage would have known about this island a few hundred miles north of Britain. But then we come to these floating islands. Well, OK, it sounds crazy, but white floating islands, icebergs? 
I mean, could yeah. this be someone's description of icebergs? In other words, mm-hmm. if you went up into the Arctic Circle and get continued further north and northwest, you would end up seeing icebergs. Now, the description in this Voyage of Merlin is so much like icebergs that they must have been written about by somebody who'd actually seen these things. Certainly no one from Britain, as far as anybody knew, had travelled that far that mm-hmm. long ago. Then you've got these fiery fireballs coming, these fireballs coming out of mountains and falling into the sea. Well, if you continue, you reach in that sort of northwest direction, you reach Iceland, which has got these, which has got volcanoes. People in Britain wouldn't have been familiar with volcanoes. So you've suddenly got a story which starts to make sense as a real historic voyage of Merlin. And only mm-hmm. by somebody who would actually witness such a voyage and come back to tell the tale would this have act- would it be, be possible to write about. So I believe that Merlin, or at least somebody who attributed Merlin as being as part of this uh, voyage, did set sail and got at least halfway to North America. Mm-hmm. And and then maybe got a little bit farther over to Maine, right? Um, Yes, the the reason that um, I think he actually got farther than that is the story, I mean, the the, the fiery mountains with these balls of fire is only about halfway through the tale. Right. He he continues on. He then then reaches a place which is described as a place with green seas. Well, the reason why Greenland is called Greenland isn't because it's got green on it. It's one of the so- snowiest, inhospitable places on the planet. It's <laughs> called that because it's got these rocks under the coast of Greenland, which are green rocks, which make the sea appear green. So again, mm. it seems he got as far as Greenland. And then it talks about a place they eventually reach with great, long, wide sands of white sand, which stretch for miles with these beaches. Well, Porcupine Strand, which is on Labrador Island in Canada, exactly matches that description. And cutting a very long story short, Merlin and his crew then sail down the coast of Avalon, which they're describing this this new land, which I believe is North America, from Canada down. And the reason I say Maine is just off the coast of Maine, there's an island by the name of Manana Island, which was known that Mm -hmm. by the Native Americans. Right. The actual island where Merlin ends up in this tale, uh, although the actual land is called Avalon, the specific island of Avalon where he ends up is called the island of Mananan. Mananan being an ancient sea god. Mananan, Manana. Mm-hmm. It's too close. And, and, and that Manana island, Manana, Manana, uh, where we say Manana, but Merlin say <laughs> Manana. <laughs> it's like banana, banana. It's said that Manana. Yeah. I'm not sure how the Native Americans originally said it, but that is yeah. off the coast of Maine. It's a tiny island, only about a mile and a half long and about a quarter of a mile wide. Um, and that, that's, I believe, where Merlin, according to this early story, was actually buried. And then somebody comes back and tells the tale. So I thought, wow, these places really existed. Could Merlin really be buried just off the coast of North America? <laughs> The most unlikely place that you would expect him to be buried, yes? Well, I eventually, I thought, I've got to go and look at this place. And when I arrived there, firstly, I mean, we're going back 20 years now. Uh, no, it's not that long, 10, 10 years when I mm. first went there. Um, it was in the middle of winter, absolutely uh. the middle of winter. And there was no regular boat service out there. Nobody lives out there. Um mm. I think there's an automatic lighthouse beacon type thing. And mm-hmm. I managed to literally I had to pay off some fisherman to, to sail me out to this place. <laughs> um, and he said, well, you know, you're not going to like the voyage. Well, I didn't. I mean, the boat was being thrown around all over the place. I thought we were going to die about three or four times. But <laughs> eventually we ended up on this. I ended up on this rock and the, and, and the guy, you know, the fisherman, he said, right, you've got like an hour and then I'm going back because the, the, there's a storm come in and then you'll be stuck here. Well, it was just, the island was just covered with snow. There's not even any trees there or anything. Huh. Um, but luckily, some of the snow was, was 
virtually non-existent because of the winds that were rolling in from the Atlantic had actually made one half the island pretty bare so I could see the ground. So he told me that as far as he knew, nobody really very often wandered around this island, there were some old strange standing stones over the other side, you know, the, 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 the eastern side of the island, and that these stones, somebody thought, had got some inscriptions on, the, on them, and they thought they might be runic that had been left by Vikings. Mm-hmm. So I decided to go and find this. Eventually I found it, and it's like a mound. Uh, and on this mound are a couple of stones that were like standing stones in Britain, like British standing stones, mm-hmm. but they'd fallen over, and they were about four feet long each. And definitely on one of them, you could see that something had been inscribed that looked like runes, but wasn't actually runes in a Viking style. It looked more like um, uh, Ogham script, which is the name of early British form of writing, although it had been too eroded away to really tell. But Mm -hmm. there was definitely writing on one of these stones. and, and, And these two stones looked like British grave markers or standing stones. And... As far as I know, there is no other um, example in that area of the Native Americans erecting stones as monuments. So, mm-hmm. it, the only, and, and later I discovered that this was the only kind of outstanding monument of any kind on this island. So, on the island where the voyage of Merlin had led me to think that Merlin might be buried, there was indeed a tomb consistent with the tomb of a British person from 1,500 years ago. Doesn't sound like a coincidence to me. <laughs> I mean, it just, well, it, it, I, everything's I, I, falling in place, if, right? If it, if it is a coincidence, it is a very, very... It, the coincidence is weirder than the actuality. In other yeah. words, the chances against it are millions to one. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, you know, there are people that would be shaking their heads, especially... Probably back in Europe, what Merlin in the states buried in the states? This is you know unheard of kind of thing. But that's kind of you know what you're talking about in the book and and the um, discovery of Avalon in the New World. Yeah, one of the, one of the really interesting things, um, and the, again, this is coming back to the supernatural side of it. And I, this, I couldn't get my head around this one. Everything I've... See, what I do is I, I investigate it from an historical and archaeological point of view. I don't tend to look at things uh, from a mystical aspect. I mean, if that comes into it, that's fine. But I'm just looking at the history behind it. Is there something written? Is there something being found archaeologically? What's at these places when you go there? But sometimes that things happen which make me think, wow, that is suggesting that there really is such a thing as magic. Um, in the voyage of Merlin, when he, they, just before Merlin is actually buried on this island of Mananan, Manana Island, mm-hmm. just before he's buried there, they visit the main island of the Avalon chain, if that's what you want to call it, the main mm. island, and on that island, um, they see a huge uh, princess. The princess is said to be, you know, t- as tall as a mountain. She holds in her hand a light. Upon her head is a tiara, and she holds in her arm, her other arm, a book. Well, mm. the weird thing is, they are describing the Statue of Statue Liberty. of Liberty, exactly. And I'm thinking... <laughs> Hold on a minute. And this is what they see, and they're so terrified that they flee. I'm thinking, hold on, is this now describing one of Merlin's prophecies? Mm -hmm. They actually go along the coast of North America until eventually they reach what's later New York and Mm -hmm. see, and Merlin has a vision about what New York will one day look like. Okay, it's it's just my theory, but the description is so... um, well, it is the Statue of Liberty. They are describing mm-hmm. the Statue of Liberty. So uh, yeah. either someone's had a vision or they've had a very, 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 very weird, coincidentally accurate dream about what America would look like. Yeah, that that jumps into the metaphysical realm, I think. We can leave the the scientific realm for this one because that is very, very odd, but lovely odd. 
Yeah. Yeah, it's odd. I mean, I've, 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 I mentioned that in my book. I, th- I think at the time somebody said, oh, you can't put that in. They're going to sort of start sort of like thinking that everything else you write is just about mysticism. I said, yeah. well, the fact is I have put in there what is in the book, The Voyage of Merlin. If one wants to go to the British Library and have a look at The Voyage of Merlin and the translations they've got there, um, then look at it. It's in there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And the, and, 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 and the book has actually been dated by the kind of ink and carbon dating, whatever else they use on old manuscript. Okay. Somebody almost, you know, getting on for 1,500 years ago, well, 1,400 years ago anyway, wrote about this. So whether Merlin existed or not, that's immaterial almost. Somebody wrote about what America would look like mm-hmm. 1,400 years in the future. How did they do it? Wow. Yeah, that, that's kind of amazing. And... There are some other amazing things in the book that you talk about. Um, one of them, I'm trying to squeeze everything in. <laughs> um, um, in the medieval Arthurian tales, Merlin is said to have been the guardian of the Holy Grail. And stories speak of how Merlin's descendants continued as guardians of the Grail. And you've actually traced the descendants of the historical Merlin to the Spencer family, as in Princess Diana. Um, and... In that bloodline, um, you, maybe you can explain it just a little bit, because now it's really attached to the current royal family with Prince William set to be the future king. So that, I thought, was rather amazing, too. Yeah, uh, the, the, the figure of Ambrosius, um, I tried to trace what had happened to him. Um, remember I said his surname was Aurelius? Yes. The... In, in a, within living memory of Merlin's time, there was a monk by the name of Gildas who came from what's now Wales and the west of Britain. And Gildas uh, wrote about uh, various um, important high-status individuals in Britain, chieftains. And one of these is named um, Aurelius. His surname is Aurelius. And mm-hmm. it is quite clear that he is a member of the same family as Ambrosius Aurelius. In fact, it turns out, based on a number of old Dark Age genealogies, that's family trees preserved from you know, 1,500 years ago, that mm-hmm. um, Canius Aurelius, as this monk Gildas describes it, is in fact the son of Ambrosius Aurelius. Mm. So when I've actually got a son of Merlin, now Merlin doesn't tend to have a son in most of the medieval stories. Um, there are some that do refer to Merlin's son, um, but none of them give him a name. So I'd actually found a name of Merlin's son that no one had seemed to have dug out before. Huh. So I tried to find out what had happened to his descendants. And cutting a very long story short, based on all sorts of Dark Age family trees, which then led me to standing uh, stones or uh, pillars, monuments with inscriptions on, which also gave the lineage of various other kings, I was able to trace the direct male line of descendants, direct line, because the British kingship was supposed to get on the male line, totally unfair, but that's the way they had it, (laughs) right the way down to somebody who lived in the 1600s, they don't have any children except for girls. So then, and only under those circumstances, do women become the direct heir. That's how we keep getting queens in this country, like Queen Victoria, Queen Elizabeth, and our present Queen Elizabeth. They're all, they only become the queen of the country if the, their father hasn't had a male offspring. So the same thing happens with earls and lords and all the rest of the aristocrat, aristocrats in Britain. So you can get a female line, and then from a female line, you've then got the beginning of the Spencer family, who eventually you've then got Lady Diana Spencer is of that direct line of descent, and her son is, one of her sons is William, who is the heir to the British throne. And so William is a pretty much accept in the last couple of generations direct descendant of the man who was Merlin. And the old prophecies, especially in this book, The Voyage of Merlin, says that one day Merlin's descendants will again become kings of Britain. 
will themselves become kings of Britain. Because remember, in the early stories, Merlin is himself at one point a leader of Britain before Arthur's time. Mm-hmm. And now we have William, who is set to be the first one of that line to be a king of Britain since Merlin was around. Uh, uh, when when, uh, when uh, Queen Elizabeth dies and then when her son Charles dies, he's next in line. Mm-hmm. So it looks like he will be the king of Britain one day. The interesting thing is his middle name is Arthur. He was mm-hmm. also born on Midsummer's Day, which, interestingly, is the day that traditionally Merlin is said to have been born. Uh-huh. Another weird thickens. set of strange mystical coincidences. I love it. I absolutely love it. Um, you know, now there are different interpretations of what the Holy Grail actually was. I mean, some people say it was the chalice that Jesus drank from at the Last Supper. Some people consider Mary Magdalene's womb was the Holy Grail. Do you believe there was or is such a vessel? And if so, what do you think it was and what happened to it? I mean, I, I you know, you read where the Knights Templar owned it way back when at some point, you know? Yes, the um, well, there's so many different grail. Grail, incidentally, the word grail simply comes a shortening of the word engrail, which means a um, a relic, a, a, a something that had once belonged to a saint or a holy person. Some people say that the word comes from San Graal, which is a separate thing, which means sacred blood. I think because you've got these very separate, these very similar names, San Graal, Holy Grail, or Sant Graal, Holy Grail. One meaning a sacred vessel that belonged to an important person. The other meaning um, something to do with holy blood, where you've, which causes two separate legends to be confused as one. One about the cup that Jesus used at the Last Supper, and another one being a cup that Mary Magdalene had, in which she collected um, a few drops of Christ's blood at the crucifixion, according to very early Christian tradition. Both of them became the grail in medieval stories. Both of them were sought by King Arthur and his knights in the medieval stories. But it became the cup of the Last Supper, which became the most popular and carried on being written about. And it tends to be known about today. Um, But the cup of Mary Magdalene, which is said to be a scent jar that she used to anoint Jesus's body to prepare him for burial. uh, She she used the the oil to to anoint his body, but then found that he had risen from the the tomb. And as proof, he said to her, um, you know, collect a few drops of my blood in that cup that you've got there and you can prove to the disciples I've risen. Now, this Jesus's blood in this small ointment or or scent jar that she had, which is known as the alabaster jar, um, is um, said to have then been imbued with um, miraculous healing powers. Anyone who drink from it will be cured of any kind of ill, was eventually supposedly, again, in legend, um, hidden and somehow later on was brought to Britain. Well, what was interesting, historically, the historical records tell us that one of the first Christian Roman um, leaders was an empress called Empress Helena in the early 300 ADs. She, in 325 AD, I believe, travelled to Jerusalem in search of holy relics. She came back with things that people had given her, like splinters from the original cross, uh, thorns from the crown of thorns, nails that had pierced the hands of Jesus. And she also came back with a cup that was said to be the alabaster jar that Mary Magdalene had. Now, whether or not she really did get this stuff or people in Jerusalem were just palming her off with any old rubbish, who knows? <laughs> the fact of the matter is that she had a cup, which she believed anyway, had belonged to Mary Magdalene and had been this original grail. When Rome was sacked in 410 AD, a lot of the most important things in Rome, including these holy relics that the Empress Helena had eventually had originally brought there, um, were taken from Rome and on a convoy of carts were eventually taken across Europe and brought to Britain because the whole of the Roman Empire was falling. It was being invaded by the barbarians from Easter, from the Huns, from the steppes of Russia and from Germanic tribes and so forth were basically taking over all of mainland Europe and only Britain was allowed 
last vestige of Roman civilization. So this is where a number of these items were brought to, including this cup that Mary Magdalene is supposed to have had. So it ends up in Britain, and it ends up being in one and the same place as where I've identified where the historical Merlin was associated with in the centre of England, the Roman city, an old Roman city called Viraconium. Mm -hmm. So remember I talked about his descendants, Merlin's mm -hmm. descendants, um, mm -hmm. eventually being Prince William. Um, half, halfway down this line of descendants, you've got a, a split uh, um, where one side of the family eventually ends up being Prince William. Another side of the family dies out in the middle of the 1800s with a man called Thomas Wright, and Thomas Wright was a, a, a historian in the, in the 1850s. He believed, he wrote about the fact that what the cup he had, what, he had a cup that he claimed he'd, he'd inherited from his ancestors. And this cup was once belonged to Mary Magdalene, had miraculous healing powers. Nobody believed him. He didn't have any children to hand this cup on to. So he decided to hide it and leave a whole series of elaborate clues, including a huge stained glass window in a church that he paid to have erected there, um, which he said held clues as to where this cup would be. And cutting a very long story short, I nobody had really taken this seriously. So because I thought, wow, this is worse taking this guy seriously, because at least, well, he is descended from the person I think is historical Merlin. There is a cup that was associated with Mary Magdalene that did end up in Britain. He claims to have got it. I'll try and solve his clues. That took a good few years. But eventually I discovered that it had already been found in the 1920s by accident mm. by a, a man who was clearing an area for building work. His family found this small green cup in the base of a statue, which was where all the trail of clues had led me. And then... His family had kept this cup. They didn't know what it was. They didn't even know it was supposed to be the Holy Grail or anything. And eventually I traced the great-granddaughter of this man who'd found this cup, and it turned up in the attic of their house, just wrapped up in old newspaper. They thought it was a Victorian mustard pot. It looks for all the world like a egg cup. Uh, it's about the same size as an egg cup. I took it to the British Museum to sort of ask them what they thought of it. They immediately said, well, it's made of green alabaster. Remember, Mary Magdalene's cup was supposed to be made of alabaster. Mm -hmm. They said it is um, probably a Roman scent jar. And they showed me a lot of others in there that looked exactly the same, except they had tops on them and this one didn't. That had obviously been lost, a lid. Mm -hmm. And they said that it's probably, by look at the stone, it comes from the Middle East, possibly Palestine, and it's about 2,000 years old. So it's made of the right stuff, it's the right age, and it comes from the right place to have really been associated with Mary Magdalene. Wow. So, um, and, well, basically the people who had that cup said... Well, we don't really want it, to be quite honest, and we're getting too many reporters coming round here saying, have you got the Holy Grail? And they said, if you don't keep sending people to us, you can hold on to it. And I've still got it to this day. Wow. So I don't know whether, whether that was really the cup that belonged to Mary Magdalene. It was certainly Mary Magdalene's. Uh, it, uh, it may have been a cup that inspired the Grail legend. But so my search for Merlin eventually ended up with me going on a quest to, uh, to discover at least a Holy Grail. Well, that's better than no Holy Grail. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> actually rather amazing. I'm, I'm the only person I know that actually claims to have one. Yes, yes, I wouldn't have thought to come across and now I feel honored to know someone who actually claims to have had one that's <laughs> that's really special it really is I mean the, the age and everything on it just again another <laughs> coincidence well, so many just... of these, I mean how many of these coincidences can you have before you start thinking well there's something weird going on here <laughs> mm-hmm exactly exactly and what's really even weirder is that the hour is almost up. It, it's really oh, wow. frustrating. Seven yeah, years. I know. And, and and this is such a well-researched book with so much in it. Um, for those who want to sit down with a wonderfully interesting and thought-provoking book, where can our listeners find it? Um, they can just go onto Amazon or they can go to the publishers, which is Inner Traditions. Um, Inner Traditions Publishers, um, you can find it there. They They are still selling it. And um, or you can look on my website, which is grahamphillips.net, and you'll find a link there. 
And I must say, it's a very well put together website with information about all your books, and and everything is amazingly interesting. I I got stuck there for half a day. Um, oh, could, <laughs> yeah, it was. It, it, that's a good thing. But um, the good news is for everybody listening that um, you're going to come back at some point down the line because we have another book that we're going to be talking about, which is. The Lost Tomb of King Arthur, and I'm looking very much forward to that. That will be out shortly, right? Yes, King. Uh, the The search for the Lost Tomb of King Arthur is coming out on the 18th of April, so somewhere around then, I shall be on your show and yes. uh, telling you how I believe I found Arthur's tomb. Well, we found Merlin, so it's only right to find Arthur's, not so. Well, precisely. <laughs> <laughs> we have to keep it. Keep it working that way. Well, thank you so much for joining me tonight. And as I said, I'm looking forward to the next visit because your books are fascinating. I love history. And, and you the tales that you tell are lovely and well-researched. And it's like, you know, I, I can't wait. And I'm going to have to get the other books, too, just because... Just because. What can I say? <laughs> so, anyway... Thank you thank very you. much, Marla. That's very kind of you to say. <laughs> and we we will see you sometime in April, I believe. And I want to thank everybody for listening in tonight. And until next time, everybody, blessed be and merry meet again. Good night. This has been another edition of Stirring the Cauldron with Marla Brooks. Be sure to tune in next week at this same time for another great guest and more cauldron stirring. Any rebroadcast or other use of this program without explicit permission is strictly prohibited. Copyright 2014. Moonlight Hall by Kevin McLeod. Licensed through Incompetech.com.